Good afternoon. If you guys there at the back settle down, this is a very interesting discussion and some of it we have heard in bits and pieces through the minister's dialogue in the morning with Mr. Chawla and then again when we were discussing how to take education forward and it, it keeps popping up the So we're going to spend the next one hour uh, discussing should our higher education system be more India focused? As usual, the discussion, uh, I'll set the pace and then I'll ask each of you to speak for about seven, eight minutes, then we have a lot more time uh, to discuss the issue. Um, much more interaction, the students get to speak with you also. So I'm going to set the stage with some provocative statements so that we get something going. So the very definition of education is that it's not, cannot be fitted into one umbrella, one silo, or Indianized or not Indianized, that would be one issue. For instance, the Prime Minister of India has in the last 18 months visited over 30 countries. There must be a reason why he's going abroad. The global economy is in a turmoil. So do we just study only the Indian economy or should we also study the global economy? Should we study only Kautilya or should we study Adam Smith, Hume, the Chicago School and the works? The floods in Chennai were a cause of concern for a lot of people and grief for a lot of people. So even if the direct correlations are yet to come through, it had something to do with climate change. So do we study the climate only in India or do we study the global climate change? So when we say that should our higher education system be India focused, I think what we are looking for is that when we reach the higher education system, do you know enough about India? Or if the panel thinks differently, they can light the fire here. The question really is what, what the student wants to learn. Does he want to learn a particular language or in a particular language or a particular kind of science? All those are options that I believe that they should be left open. There's been a lot of lament and grief about Indians not knowing about India and that we know the history that Macaulay wrote or other people wrote. I studied in central school, I studied partly in Hindi medium because I was the first batch of 10 plus 2 and the textbooks didn't arrive and I studied geography, civics, history in Hindi and uh, the other subjects in English. So you make do with what happens and you learn whatever has to be learned. Uh, I don't feel denied that I wasn't taught about Chanakya or about uh, the early Mahabharat. I do feel denied that my college education economics professors never spoke about Hume or Smith or Bentham uh, or about Friedman. Uh, I feel cheated that I wasn't taught Bhagwat, which is one of the most essential perhaps the perfect book on philosophy, life, uh, I feel cheated, that wasn't there. But is the Bhagavad Gita only India focused? I'm sorry, it's a global, it's a universal text. So I'm going to, with that provocative remark, I am going to ask first Anirban Ganguly to set the stage and then Rajiv and then Ritabhata. Is that fine? You guys can come here or you want to do that? Then. So eight minutes and I'm going to clinkle the glass at eight minutes. Thank you, uh, Shankar Ayyajji. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Prabhuji for inviting me here. It's, I've been going on writing columns every month. It's quite an um, interesting experience to finally come here and be uh, part of this conclave. In fact, uh, 
Uh, I'll uh, not. Ex I'll just give a few general uh, thoughts and ideas, and uh, there has been sufficient provocation or setting us on. Um, so this question whether Indian education needs to be uh, Indianized, interestingly, was a question that really uh, tormented our uh, freedom fighters most of whom were educationists as well. So in the morning when they said this uh, question was raised whether politicians should frame education policies, our uh, freedom fighters were educationists and uh, excessively or uh, with a determination thought about what, in, what shape Indian education must really take. So the Bengal National College the national education movement, and you had this entire galaxy of leaders in that, Bipin Chandrapal, Satish Mukherjee, Sri Aurobindo, Tilak, and uh, so many others, Brahmabandha Vupadhyay, the Catholic Sannyasi, Tagore himself, who were obsessed with this idea. So I, I was just remembering this, I have this habit of going back uh, and trying to correlate. Shankar made a very interesting point. He said, do we know enough about India when we reach higher education? Or should we study Kautilya and not Adam Smith, or Adam Smith and Kautilya, both? So I'll start with uh, an interesting point because we are here in Chennai and uh, Dr. Madhu Kishwar is here. She's one of those scholars who has worked with this scholar I'm going to mention and that is Dharampal. Did I know that not very far from Chennai is the village of Uttaramerur, which had the Chola inscription, 1100 years old, which could be even considered a constitution. But how many of us are really taught about that? That it was such a detailed constitution that it enumerated, it gave out the framework of elections, it gave out, it stated who could be elected or stand and aspire to hold office. It even set the age limit up till which you could hold office. And uh, 1100 years old. You had the Chingalpet inscriptions which talked about the Indian tradition of food distribution and security. 60 kilometers from here. Has our education system really opened us up to these civilizational fundamental achievements that we have had. Similarly, there's this entire gamut of foreign observers who have described India through the 17th, 18th century at a period when India was getting colonized who diligently recorded the Indian structure, the system of society, and who kept records. For example, Alexander Walker, we have heard of James Mill, it's British history of, history of British India. Mills never visited India, but there was Alexander Walker, who worked in India for 40 years, who recorded uh, the society, Indian society at that point of time, whose notebooks even today are preserved in the National Archives of Scotland. Dharampal studied all of these. And he made his assessment of Indian society based on these records, on these inscriptions. So essentially my point is, we need to know these stories, we need to know these achievements, we need to be conversant with these before we can even aspire or think whether Indian education needs to be Indianized. Dr. Kishwar has done extensive work on the Khaps, trying to understand and evaluate our own system of solving problems. In fact, the Shastra University has an, old, an entire department of legal anthropology, trying to understand and record our own habits and traditions of dispute solving. Therefore, on the one hand, for example, uh, the other day we were having a discussion on the Northeast. 
Edward Gates is still considered the authority on Northeast, and every civil servant reads Edward Gates. But S. K. Bor Pujari's history, political history of Assam, is equally is an equally erudite work, if not more, more up to date. But that is never prescribed or hardly prescribed into the syllabus. Evolution of Indian political parties, post-independence and pre-independence. While building up the central library, I went and I wanted the documents of the history of the Communist Party in India. But I could not get the entire collection. Are there departments in our universities which teach the evolution of Indian political parties post-independence? Are there departments in our universities which discuss comparative religious studies? So, you see, these are, uh, these are the issues, and Radha Krishnan Commission, uh, Education Commission in 1948, brought up these issues. Anand Kumara Swami, in his uh, essays on national idealism, says that uh, the most crushing indictment of this education, he talked about the education at that point of time, but we need to really ask ourselves whether it's different today, is the fact that it destroys in the great majority of those upon whom it is inflicted all capacity for the appreciation of Indian culture. The syncretic, peculiar character of Islam that grew in India. Do we have departments which really study and encourage a deep understanding of that strand? There's this entire, entire study which says that in India, the concept or the entire phenomenon of famine was something very alien. You have William Digby who made this entire study of the famine campaign in South India. And you had R.C. Dutt. Are we taught these? Are they incorporated into our syllabus? When we, when we learn the history of the freedom movement, do we know the contribution of Subramaniam Bharati on one side and the contribution of Rani Gaidilu on the other in the Northeast and in the South? And can I amalgamate that multiplicity in myself and understand the contribution these multiple dimensional contributions that leaders and scholars have made. I was really, when listening to Sarad Babu, where he talks about the capacity for learning from our surrounding. This was one more extensive debate that our leaders undertook in the early days of the freedom struggle, where they said that the textbooks that are being written are not allowing us to imbibe from our surrounding. Has that situation changed today? Is the NCRT textbook being written by someone sitting in Delhi, not being prescribed for someone sitting in rural Karnataka? Has the, uh, in fact, the entire basic education concept, the entire argument of basic education was based on this? Do we, have we really absorbed from the experiences of our own education, is, be it Krishnamurti, be it Gijubai Badeka, be it Sri Aurobindo, have we absorbed from their system of thought and incorporated some of it in our vision of education? I myself obviously studied in Sri Aurobindo Ashram and had the, had the opportunity of growing up in the system of integral education. So right from the beginning, we were taught not only Sanskrit, but we were taught the classical languages of the West, our own mother tongue, as well as the as well as the language of the region where we lived and grew up. So these are a few points I want to make, and there are actually many. Uh, you know, for example, the, the tribal and regional narratives, totally neglected. The, the NCRT did a study, and Kapila Vatsayan wrote about this in 1972 in her monograph for the UNESCO. And uh, in 2004, the NCRT had undertaken a study of 11,000 students, uh, schools across the country, rural as well as uh, urban, with this, whether students would like to be exposed to facets of Indian culture and in all their dimensions. 91 students, 91% uh, of students interviewed said that they would, they have a thirst for it, but the present structure doesn't allow it to be done. And I'm not trying to get into a sort of ideologization or compartmentalization. What I'm say saying is, we have a certain traditions which have evolved from this soil. 
are we sensitizing our young minds to those traditions enabling them to absorb from that is our syllabus geared up to that to do that and unless we do that we can really not absorb from our surrounding it becomes an extremely artificial approach uh, and probably it only generates more confusion in what it really means to indianize education um, so if i uh, i think i have overshot my time no it's okay right so <laughs> Thank you so much. But I, if I just have an opportunity, I just take half a minute if you do give me. Uh, the mother was obviously French by birth, but she lived her entire life, most of her life in Pondicherry. And she says something very interesting. She gave this message to the French Institute, which was inaugurated in Pondicherry. And I find this very fascinating. She says, in any country, the best education that can be given to children consists in teaching them what the true nature of, this, of their country is and its own qualities. But at the same time, one should add to that a wide understanding of the role of other nations without the spirit of imitation and without ever losing sight of the genius of one's own country. It is this understanding of the genius of one's own country. Uh, the question remains open whether our education system allows that or not. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anirban. That was very good. You know, along with the uh, institutions and individuals, uh, the Guru Shishya Parampara, the Gurukul system, Subramanya Bharti. Uh, I mean, I live in Pune now and Gokhale, Tilak, Ranade, I mean, they were the f front pioneers of the early education thoughts. There is also the fact that languages are dying. So there is, there is an issue of that that one must be. And I wanted to place this with Rajiv also and you know for maybe later. A lot of our history tends to be hagiography. I think we, th this is a concept that needs to be worked at. Let, it put it, let us put it in front of the uh, students. Let them decide who was great or didn't great. I mean you spoke about uh, a lot of people who did, I mean the greatest work on early economic India was Angus Madison, another Scottish uh, economist and some of the most revealing data on from 11th century to 18th century was done by Angus Madison. So those are texts I, I haven't read. R.C. Dutt you spoke about. R.C. Dutt is barely mentioned in any history department or any department of political economy. I mean, he, if anybody has done extensive work on the Bengal famine and the famines of India, it is R.C. Dutt. And that book is not available. When I was writing my book, that book is not available. That is the state of the... Rajiv, please. Good afternoon. Some years ago, I was teaching at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, and we faced a problem. We were, our intake was about 95% engineers. And what we discovered was that the engineers had not studied anything about India, certainly after 10th standard, neither had they studied any economics or any of the other background subjects that would be really essential for a business education. It was just the way the herd moved from engineering to the MBA. And so we had to design a course which we called Business, Government and Society and to create a course that would provoke them to understand not just well, to understand essentially the world, how the world worked outside the corporation. Everything else that they would learn in the MBA would be what, you know, accounts and strategy and everything inside the corporation. But what's the context? That's what the focus was. So, we sort of split it into two parts. One part focused on big ideas, okay? And what is the role of government? What is the role of business? interest groups, uh, regulation, you know, these sorts of larger themes. But the second part was really a capsule um, condensation of India in about 10 easy lessons, right? One session on Indian politics, one on Indian economy, things like that. We had to do this. And at the time of, and, and, and in some sense, when we talk about how we can integrate India or make India focus more of an emphasis with education. With the same balance, I think, needs to be maintained. There is a global canon. There is 
a scientific, economic, whatever subject you take, there is some universal material that has to be taught, but there also has to be substantial attention paid to the Indian context. Now, it's not so much, I, I think that's self-evident, but the real point is how do you teach that? I also, 30, 35 years ago when I did my BA, studied the Indian economy, but then we studied one lesson was on first five-year plan second five-year plan, you know, things like that. And frankly, it you know, pretty much put us to sleep rather than excited us because, well, it is a larger comp uh, problem that we faced at that time, which was if the syllabus was aimed at the masses, we were essentially trying to create some minimum knowledge that they had to, uh, they had, that they had to sort of pick up. And we were tested once a year in one common exam. The classes were never really engaging or exciting. That's the kind of uh, situation many of us faced. So when we had to design this program, we faced this challenge about readings, the one uh, Anupam was just talking about. So we did include in a, in a session on Indian society a piece by Madhu Kishwar on women and religion and India's ability to create our own gods even in modern times and you know that's the sort of uh, story that makes us sit back and say okay there's so much more that's going on. We, uh, we may have had um, uh, you know talking about readings about modern Indian uh, political evolution. I have a book chapter which is part of the LSR political science readings on the evolution of India's party system. Um, and interestingly enough, we didn't stop just with having multiple readings of this sort that we had to source. We also made sure that the exams would be drawn from uh, newspaper op-eds or something like that. So we'd take a piece from Shiv Vishwanathan and make that the kind of article on which we ask questions that you force you to bring in some insight from Indian society and something from Indian economics and some, something from Indian politics. So this way, that exam itself became an integration. It wasn't the silos of each class, but you were forced to really engage. And I don't think any of our students have ever looked at newspapers in the same way they used to before. Now they can somehow find a way to think critically, to ask questions, you know. So basically that part is something that we must think about when we think about adding an Indian content. It's not just about facts and figures, it's about why. It's about asking these questions about why is, um, uh, you know, why uh, I am consider myself reasonably well exposed to a lot of stuff, but I didn't know about the uh, Chola edict that you were talking about, right? I could have, I can imagine myself bringing that in into a PowerPoint presentation on uh, when we are discussing the preamble to the constitution or something like that, bring that in as well as, as an example of what happened before. So that kind of knowledge is not as well shared. There is, there is often a talk, of course, about uh, North Indian bias to history and things like that. But those are things that are worth debating. Now, this is the larger point, right? So I'm talking from the point of view of a BA, but in every field, if you think about, um, uh, you know, the fields like the management, of course, we need a huge amount of Indian cases. We don't have as many as we would like to because um, I'll come to that some, uh, just a little later. We haven't come to, we don't have enough because we haven't made it a priority to develop as many and we've probably not had the self-confidence to identify what is unique and successful about our own success stories in different domains. But when you think about it, when you think about um, uh, focusing on Indian problems, there is no shortage of stuff to excite our imagination, to get us inspired to, uh, to do and do things that will make an impact. And, you know, if you ask a psychology student who wants to go into counseling, what, um, you know, what, what areas would they think about? They may talk about adolescents and youth and city people. But when you think about the fact that farmers are committing suicide all the time, right? And there is no counseling mechanism of any sort that reaches out to people in distress, right? How come we don't have any connect between those tragic problems of the countryside and what we teach in our classroom? So that is the kind of question we need to be asking. Now these, as we sort of brainstorm, and if we spend more time brainstorming, in every domain, we will discover that there are lots and lots of Indian issues that are really worth engaging with. Then the question becomes, how do you engage with that? How do you integrate that? What is the mechanics of making this happen, right? Well, typically, 
throughout school and college education, you're not expected to step out of the classroom into anything of the real world, right? Either you're going to college or you're enjoying yourself, right? You may go to a cultural festival, you may pick up skills of a different sort, soft skills and all that. But, you, you know, if you look at the West, typically you have a three-month summer vacation, which is not spent as a vacation. It is spent as uh, an opportunity to intern somewhere or to go to some camp or something of that sort. So those mechanics creating space in the, in the timetable itself for people to go out and engage in the real world, that's something that you need to pay attention to. When you think about this larger issue of engaging and uh, or even inspiring faculty members across domains to work on Indian issues, then, you know, today you see there's a lot of sort of snapping the finger and saying we want research, right? And someone will say every college now for NAC accreditation or something will say we are having an international conference. But it's, that's just the form. It's not, it's not really the spirit of things. How do you get that spirit of things when you say, look, what are we trying to do? We, you know, if, I, if, if you have competitions, if you have, I'm just back during my years getting tenure in the U.S. Uh, as a professor, what I observed was that, that ecosystem was geared to getting people to come up with original ideas. The National Science Foundation would hold a competition on a broad subject and people came up with their own ideas. A panel of experts would say, okay, these are the ones fund worth funding. There would be a conference for ecos ecosystem where you could go and present your work. There would be peer-reviewed journals where your work would be published and recognized and your ideas shared. So if you actually look at the Indian context, many of those things are very, very few. You know, EPW, maybe one or two other places. Where else? Everyone nowadays focuses on 800 words in an opinion piece. That's it. Not something more substantial and more detailed. So that ecosystem of grants, conferences, publications, all that has to come in. And you need to in, you know, get faculty members across the board engaged in understanding what it takes to be rigorous in, in, doing, their, in doing their work. So all that will have to come in. And of course, in during the internship period, I really think that along the way, we should also get people out of their comfort zones, provide opportunities to go into rural areas, work in the equivalents of Peace Corps here, you know, anything that would enable you to develop an empathy for Bharat rather than India. And the other issue, I think, which has been flagged a couple of times today is the issue of language. We, you know, part of the reason why we miss out on so much of our own you know, historical contribution is because most of us who will go through what is called convent education tend to become monolingual intellectuals. We are, we lose that bilingual, bilinguality or trilinguality that we grow up with because we don't engage with the writings of our own scholars, thinkers, poets, you know, and that's also I think I would blame on the system itself, on how stuff is taught. You know, for me, learning Hindi in school was an imposition. Learning Hindi poetry in college was a joy, you know. So something changed, and uh, you know, I think that's really uh, that really was uh, uh, was part of the story. And so it's not just all the content; it's not just what you want to do in terms of Indianizing. It's also about you know creating a, a, a way of provoking people's creativity, critical thinking, having debates and discussions, getting the syllabi to be up to, you know, I wouldn't say up to date, but I would say syllabi to be, uh, uh, you know, to be reasonably current and engaged with issues that matter. History may have been very hagiographic. Today we take the other extreme and we keep trying to demolish people and contributions that have been extraordinary in terms of making India what it is today. So that we have to learn some element of balance. We have to try and get a sense of um, you know, what is the balance of things. There's no one right or wrong answer and, um, uh, you know, and, and, and things change over time. It's very easy to look back and criticize decisions that were made in, in, a, in a particular time and context. And so, so really, I would call for um, a lot more attention to this. And of course, traditional knowledge, I think we need to try and work with it with an open mind. Um, I'll tell you the kinds of traditional knowledge that I have lost. Okay, I come from 
his you know, family of freedom fighters and politicians, but actually from a farming family by descent. But I grew up in Bangalore and, and the United States. And um, so when, my, when I would grow up, uh, my father would talk about different names of rains that would come. He'd say, this is the Uttara rain, this is the Mungaru, this is something else, right? So they grew up with a different understanding of weather patterns and climate and this and that. I, for the life of me, don't know what those are. It doesn't, they don't really matter, except when you talk about climate change and those kinds of issues. And of course, it's not just in this context. It's about traditional uh, expertise, like Mother Kishore was talking about, about craftspeople and their knowledge, which is dying out, which is often um, passed on from generation to generation through, through uh, families or through oral traditions or through actual craft practice. You know, and so that is also possibly dying out. And, um, and today, we are too willing to accept the Vastu consultant's de edict and say, demolish this building, put a toilet upside down, whatever they tell you to do, because, um, uh, you know, because nobody knows what is the science of it, what is the application in different parts of India. You know? So, I mean, so it's just, it just becomes an edict. And that closing of the mind should not happen in the quest for Indianizing Indian education. I'll stop there and we'll see. We'll take things from there. Thank you, Rajiv. Very well spoken. I mean, you spoke about uh, your father's knowledge of rain. In 2004, on January the 13th or 14th, I think 13th, Atal Bihari Vajpayee made a very simple statement saying, Aaj Uttarayan hai, Suraj Disha badal rahi hai. In that one statement, he combined astronomy, his knowledge of geography, his knowledge of seasons, and his sense of politics. I mean, that is the kind of text. I mean, I learned much of my Hindi and poetry listening to Vivid Bharti. That did much more to my education of Hindi and uh, understanding of Fez and uh, Nida Fazli of uh, Gulzar or Raja Mehdi Ali, all these things. But, I mean, you know, you, I don't know whether the current generation gets any of that. Uh, so we know about Rosa Parks, but we don't know about Balraj Madhok. So, you know, we, we are stranded between two different clubs. I'll uh, stop at that and Saprata, uh, if you can take care. First of all, uh, thanks to Professor Chawla for inviting me once again here to speak here. Uh, my distinguished fellow panelists, my colleague, Comrade Raj uh, Rajiv Gora is here. Now, first of all, as I was listening, Onirban started with some names, names which are familiar to me from my childhood. And of course, uh, I was listening about Tagore. So I just want to start with him. It was actually in a Congress session when Tagore went there to the Congress session. In the Congress All India session, for the first time, the complete demand for independence that was raised. In that session, Tagore recited, he presented a five stanza poetry. Incidentally, the first stanza of the poetry was taken as our national anthem of 24th of January 1950. Now, when he was speaking about this poetry, the five stanza poetry, the first, of, the first stanza of which is our national anthem, Tagore said, in that way, while speaking about that poem, about India, he said, we are the charming crucible of human civilization, and that is what our land represents. Now he went on saying that various tendencies have come, we have assimilated these tendencies, and on that basis we have advanced. There is a very famous Bengali poem, uh, known as Bharat Tirtho, where he describes this entire thing. I am not going into that. But incidentally, just before coming here, day before yesterday, I was uh, looking at this BBC epic history, series of epic history. In that series of epic history, uh, they were telling that India is the only continuing civilization in the history of human civilization anywhere in the world. It's a continuing civilization. At the time when the Chinese civilization was developing in the banks of the Wang Ho and the Yang Sikyang, when the Mesopotamian civilization was growing up by the side of the Euphrates and the Tigris, when the Egyptian civilization was by the Nile at the time, by the banks of the Indus, this famous civilization, our civilization, the ancient of the civilization and the continuing civilization was developing. Now I personally believe that we have come to a stage in India where this churning crucible that is called the Indian civilization as a variety and divergence that is unknown and unconceivable anywhere in the world. From the Kashmiriyat, Anirvan was speaking about Rajendra Chola, we are here in ITC Grand Chola itself. So from the Kashmiriyat to the Dravidian civilization to the Padi Mahal, where 
Prince Dara civilization and the continuing civilization was developing. Now I personally believe that we have come to a stage in India where this churning crucible that is called the Indian civilization as a variety and divergence that is unknown and unconceivable anywhere in the world. From the Kashmiriyat, Anirvan was speaking about Rajendra Chola, we are here in ITC Grand Chola itself. So from the Kashmiriyat to the Dravirian civilization to the Padi Mahal, where Prince Dara Shuko wrote the famous Majmam, Majmaul Bahrain, where he spoke for the first time about the synthesis of the Sufism and the Upanishads, mingling of the two oceans. That is India. Tagore said, Tagore said about this creation of Dara Shuko that this is precisely India. This is India, the India we have assimilated, we have assembled and we have moved forward. Now celebration of such a spirit, when we speak about Indianization of our higher education system, celebration of such a spirit becomes important. But problem happens when a person, I don't want to go back many years ago when I was studying in my college, I heard the union human resource development minister speaking about, no, no, this was not created by Kutubuddin Aywak. This is not Kutub Minar, this is, this was, this is, was known as Bija Stamb. I don't want to go into the debate, but unfortunately, just two years ago, when I came to the parliament in 2014, month of April, I heard after the new government came to office, the person who came, who sat at the head of the, as a head of the Indian Council of Historical Research, he was telling that Indian caste system, the Barnastram, that was very good. He was telling in a press conference, I believe the Indian caste system has been very good. And today when I speak here, I definitely, my heart goes out to Rohit Vemula, the modern Ekalabba. We have the story in Mahavarata, I don't want to go into that. But incidentally, when these things happen, when a person at the helm of affairs in the Indian Council of Historical Research says that Mahavarata and Ramayana were not mythologies, they are histories basically. That's cre that creates a confusion. I was hearing, I don't want to go into names, Indian name, Western names, but <coughs> what I read from newspaper and then I verified from my comrades there in Rajasthan, that in Rajasthan a campaign was continuously going on to purge the Indian education system of all foreign influences. Now what are these foreign influences? The minister, the minister in charge of education, Vasudev Devnani, he said to the media, media was asking him, what do you mean by foreign influences? He said, some purging is necessary. So the media was asking which names are to be purged. The minister said the name of Akbar. I, okay, it's fine. Shankar was telling that it is up to anybody who will decide whether Akbar is great, whether Ashok is great, or whether Aurangzeb is great. I don't want to go into that. But the minister said, the minister the, at the helm of affairs there, that the name of Akbar needs to be purged. Okay, fine, that's a Muslim name. The name of Akbar will be purged. After that he says, the name of Isaac Newton also needs to be purged. A Christian name and then a thousand year old Greek name. The name of Pythagoras also needs to be purged. So all names were purged. Six crore new textbooks were printed with no names of Akbar, with no names of Pythagoras, with no names of Isaac Newton. Now the problem is, I believe, I am a Marxist in belief, that no, the point is not to settle scores of the past, but to build a glorious future. Now, when I was reading a book some days earlier, it was a very famous French intellectual, and when I, in the earlier session, I heard somebody speaking about, yes, we have invented zero. It was during that glorious days of Nalunda, Nalunda University, zero was invented in India. The Arabs took away that, the Arab, the Arab the zero came to be known as an Arab numerical. Now, up to that period, when Bhaktiar Khilji came, Bhaktiar Khilji invaded, Nalunda was destroyed. All the books, all the knowledge we have gathered that was destroyed, it was around 7th century AD. Now, <coughs> up to 7th century AD, if we look into our country, we had made spectacular advances in every field. After that, the center moved away. The center moved to the west. The center of knowledge moved to the west. And definitely intolerances has been the major reason. Now, in this fascinating book known as Zero, an autobiography of a dangerous idea, Charles Saifi is saying that India, Nalanda discovered Zero, Zero was discovered. Now, at that time when capitalism was not invented, everything was settled in the in scores of religion. Now, Zero cannot be conceived 
you cannot today even you may may exclude pythagoras you may not study euclid you cannot study geometry without euclid or pythagoras that's a different thing but foreign influences must be purged so you must minus pythagoras and minus euclid but incidentally in a geometry proper geometry mathematical geometry a zero cannot be conceived even today in mathematics without having the concept of infinite infinity and zero have to go together charles safe in his book zero an autobiography of a dangerous idea is telling that this is dialectics this is the unity of opposites india have always celebrated the unity of opposites now incidentally nitish kumar was born in baktiarpur the chief minister of bihar and when nalanda university the uh, previous government when the nalanda university was resurrected again nitish kumar had a role baktiar khilji had destroyed nalanda nitish kumar who was born in baktiarpur he had a role in rebuilding that university that university is functioning i don't want to go into that functioning amartya sen had said a lot about that now problem is before the uh, the main problem what i feel today when you speak about indianization i've been hearing in indian science congresses indian history congress i went there in history congress i also gathered something but the most disturbing thing when we okay this is indianization some people are telling this is indianization this is our heritage this is our culture problem is i heard in that science congress that uh, it, this is a tendency now that fascination for technology is growing fascination for technology is growing but at the same time dislike for science that is also growing for them so for some people not for all fortunately not for all for some people modernity is not in the mind but in the manifestation of big technology some feel that there is no contradiction in developing the technology while presenting mahabharat for genetics and plastic surgery you know karna was a product of uh, stem cell this uh, test tube baby uh, our prime minister has been telling that and uh, ganesha has been a product of the plastic surgery so all these things are coming up now these things i don't know whether these are indianization of education i firmly believe that the unity of opposites the celebration of the unity of opposites that must continue yes there has been some aberrations i was hearing the name of arobindo ghosh immediately i was remembering the name of Uh, Barin Ghosh the younger brother of Arvind Ghosh if we go to the Andaman cellular jail 712 inmates were there 712 inmates in Andaman jail and as a bengali i feel very proud if you just read the 712 names 609 names were from undivided bengal out of that 609 names 91% of the revolutionaries went back incidentally joined the communist movement of the country but unfortunately you go to andaman I was asking the curator who is in charge there that why the name of Subodh Roy, why the picture of Subodh Roy is missing. The lady told me that it is not available. Now who was Subodh Roy? Subodh Roy was 13 years old when he went to Andaman Cellular Jail. The jailer came out to see that boy because never a 13 year old boy had gone to Andaman. A young schoolmaster in his 30, 32 years, he had gathered some 60 school students because he wanted to. fight against the british empire in chitagong that is in bangladesh now a chitagong armory raid was conducted this young schoolmaster he was 32 32 years old at that time and 60 of his students studying in school ranging from class 7 to class 12 they participated in that many of them died when the british sent their forces from calcutta they fled away all were captured and all were given death sentence but except two the rest were not given death sentence because all were below the age of 18 all were deported to andaman but incidentally the pictures of this revolution it is a missing because the ideas of the ruling class in every epoch are the ruling ideas the ruling class doesn't want this picture that has been there these aberrations have been there but after all what is happening now in the name of indianization of education it's most unfortunate i personally feel that the most unfortunate things are going on and i will just mention when this intolerance is growing because if this intolerance continues indian education everything everything will be in a problem as i mentioned earlier up to 7th century ad spectacular advances were stalled when bakhtiar khilji attack when the intolerance started now i was just remembering hearing to anirban about shami vivekananda vivekananda while speaking at the chicago conference of religion he said that was the final portion of his speech i quote i take pity from the bottom of my heart of those who believe in the destruction of someone else's religion for the purpose of his own religion 
in the final analysis it shall be inscribed on the banner of every religion assimilation not destruction now this, this needs to be the hallmark let there be battle of ideas let there be brainstormings what will remain what will not remain let there be healthy debates but i yes i have many political differences with pandit nehru but still the most prominent of the indian prime ministers a completely modern man pandit nehru just after he attained independence he went to elava the university to give his convocation speech and in that convocation speech it was none other than pandit nehru who said a university stands for humanism a university stands for tolerance for reason for the adventure of ideas and for the search of truth it stands for the onward march of human race towards even higher objectives if the university discharges its duties adequately then it will with the people of the nation it is will it will be well with the people of the nation so the well of the people of the nation i believe that well of the people cannot take place if people think that uh, ganesh was a product of plastic surgery and karna was born out of test tube so with that belief and i believe this unity of opposites no forces that will be whatever may be the name i don't want to go into the name but this unity of opposites that has been the celebration i don't want to recite the entire poem that is in sanskritized bengali i don't want to also mention the first para which was basically uh, our the national anthem janagana mana in the second para tagore was saying aharah tava aho bhana pracharit sunidava udaro bani hindu bauddha sig jaina parashik musalman kristani पूरब पश्चिम आशे तब सिंहासन पाशे प्रेम हार हय तब गाथा एंड इन द एंड व्हेन टेगोर वाज कंक्लूडिंग ही सेड रात्रि प्रभातिल उदिल रविच्छवि पूर्व उदय गिरि भाले गाहे बिहंगम पुण्य समीरन नव जीवन रस ढाले तव करुणारुण रागे निद्रित भारत जागे तव चरणे नत माथा लेट अस बी ट्रू टू truthful things with that i conclude we have time for five questions but i just wanted to lay a couple of points that i mean ha huh? five minutes okay so three questions so among the things that we discuss about history of india about 12 or 14 years back prabhu and i had a discussion about the debates in the constituent assembly with great difficulty we digitized we got somebody to digitize and put those debates on to the parliament website and the all the sections of the debates are there since 14 months i have been trying and i know the chairman of the national book trust is a friend to digitize those debates into a kindle version so young people can read what the level of discourse and discussion in india was when india debated its constitution i mean it is such a tragedy that this debates of the constituent assembly which should be taught probably the 8th and the 9th and the 10th standard for people to know the quality of disagreement quality of dissent i mean it's astounding how uh, ayangar uh, ayer of the ambedkar nehru uh, all these people they disagreed on such so many vital issues and today when we speak about lok sabha and rajya sabha i'm sorry to say this but i mean you know to call the rajya sabha the house of the unelected i i really think that rajya sabha members are not doing justice to the constitution they are not unelected they may not be directly elected but this this whole concept of unelected is really untenable so the, if you go back to that debate you know how much debate was happened on on the creation of the rajya sabha we talk about missing pictures there is i don't know i'm happy to be educated i don't know of any book which actually describes the history of the labor and uh, union movement i mean you know there has been a role uh, in europe of how labor and unions contributed there is a role in india we talk about missing text why isn't buddha being taught why isn't buddhism principles being taught isn't that uh, a part of our culture uh, we should have that 
so the debate has to open up i think what what one essential part that i wanted to mention was that there is a lot that we can lament about our education system about our syllabus about our policies and about our government but we cannot escape from the fact that over the last 30 40 years we have created a marketplace for living and the culture of exchange that ruled india that defined india has been slowly and steadily decimated in the sense that you now have colleges which don't teach you basics just teach you the theories so it's it's something that we must uh, look at because we just cannot call ourselves argumentative indians and not have anything to argue about with that i open the floor for questions prabhu has said three questions yes the gentleman in the blue t-shirt there first question uh and the next two questions i'm going to take only students so two students on the back hi it's murli from cambridge university um uh, it's um, i i don't think actually i mean i'm just making a point and then i'll come to the question it's a direct question actually no quite a direct question okay will you treat uh, i mean this to marxists basically uh, mr banerji will you treat as mass murderer serial rapist genocidal cult and a philosophy which has kind of some science fiction confused as science the same you know the history of lenin stalin the chinese revolution and 40 million 10 million 30 million people killed all across beyond anything it's a genocidal cult will you say it is the same as uh, somebody the prime minister saying i mean it might it might something we can mock at but is it the same that that's your interpretation it's history the no, no. genocide no, no, no. of historical facts no, no, no. i'm sorry that's your interpretation i i i always believe we always believe basically that we are open to battle of ideas your ideas be there be there my ideas be there that is a distorted history that is going on if no you may tell it fact i believe that's a distortion you i will just tell you an example when stalin as you mentioned stalin two of the most famous people who wrote about stalin one is anna louise strong and another is isaac doister Anna Louise Strong was a pro-Stalinist, and Isaac Doister was an anti-Stalinist, core anti-Stalinist. Isaac Doister. So Isaac Doister in his book wrote, after you know, a recent book has been published from England. The name of the book is Russia's Heroes by Albert Axel, in which he shows that from 1941 to 1945, every day 19,000 19, Soviet people gave their life in order to save the world from fascism. now doister says that after the nuremberg trial was over they had gone to russia to see because stalin was continuously telling that there are no schools and colleges schools in russia where there is a single child single boy or girl studying from whose family people have not died in this great war great war to save mankind so doister says that we have arbitrarily gone to a school and i know we have entered a class and after entering the class we have asked that is there how many people are there in this class that uh, from whose family people have gone to the war and died doister says the entire class rose up one boy was sitting his head was down so i asked him that why are you not uh, why then I, when the boy rose up doister says doister writes that's history will it is available anywhere you can try it doister says that boy was crying so when i asked him why are you crying the boy said, of stalingrad my father's leg was amputated so my father came back so i am devoid of the glory of standing up so that's also history you need to study that you need to study capitalist history you need to study also people's history because there is a famous saying you know no as long as the lions don't have their own historians the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter okay it's students last row no only students now so there are three very good uh panelists here so i, I don't look old, any I questions okay the young at heart question okay shampa says young at heart hello question please we have only 2 minutes left we have too many versions of what india is one is the left version one is the nagpur version or the italy version so what india are we talking about number one and uh, so the, the india focus why do we look have to look at the past why not we uh, discover a future and think only on the, about the future when you are talking about india okay good question rajiv you want to take that 
see, there is this concept of lessons of history, right? And um, interpretations of history. There are issues about the foundation from which you build the future. And what are those foundations? How did we get there? Has there been exploitation and injustice and violence in the past? How was that perpetrated? How was that justified? All those sorts of questions need to be asked and answered before you can move forward. At the same time, we also want to make sure that when we do that, we don't get caught only in some divisive stories and fights about something that happened thousand, five thousand years ago. We have to, in the spirit of your question, start focusing on, okay, what do we do to make India a better place? How do we make education come alive in such a manner that people can relate to the world and the context within which we live? But too often, because our higher education and lower education, whatever, has not been Indianized enough. We haven't got enough of an understanding of our own context, of the conflicts. You know, we know if you come to, say, Karnataka, you will find that there are a whole bunch of, oh, you know, in Tamil Nadu for that matter, a whole bunch of gods that people worship who are Rama and Krishna and the Sanskritic gods. There are a whole other set of gods that are uh, Bhutas and spirits and village goddesses and things like that. And they have their own practices and traditions. And, you know, so where do these come from? What is the implication? What happened? You know, when you talk about urban planning today, if we don't understand that villages were built in segregated ways and particular communities lived in particular ways, they, um, you know, that uh, some other groups had issues about what they could access and what they couldn't, all that is important to understand when we try to build newer uh, cities when we want to ensure change. So we have the need for some amount of historical um, knowledge, but as I said, we don't want to basically talk in glib, glib ways, right? People, for example, often criticize Nehru on the embrace of communist China, right? And actually, somewhere along the way, he says, look, we were two great civilizations re-emerging after you know, centuries of whatever neglect and decline. But we have two choices. Either we embrace each other as friends and move forward, now that they are our neighbors with Tibet no longer between us, or we decide to be enemies, in which case we will, you know, that can have its own negative outcomes, right? So you have to give it a chance. Today, when we look at 1962 and the aftermath, we only criticize. Today, it's very easy to again criticize Nehru for the planning and the, the whole approach that dominated in the first 10, 20 years. But without that, we probably wouldn't have had the, uh, the foundations for everything else that has come. Much of the misuse, you know, there's a Vivek Debroy piece in Swarajya, of all things, uh, basically talking about how a lot of what Nehru, uh, what we blame him for, is actually things that no, happened no, after public, him. Public sector I'm, units were just 63 till Nehru was there. When yeah. Nehru died, there were only 63 units. By the time Mrs. Gandhi was done, there were 200. Right. So, basically, these are all evolution, ideas evolve, context change, what is right and what is wrong, dis you know, we, dis uh, we, we disagree about. But, basically, let's look forward, let's not fight battles over things that happened hundreds of years ago, and let's find ways to build that, you know, dream, um, society of our dreams, which is equitable, inclusive, Mr. Brother, you else. wanted to say, say something? I just as a... Yeah, I'll come to you, Anirban, once again. Ah, Anirban, you too. No, I, I just wanted to say, you know, there can be many ideas of India, there can be a Nagpur idea, Kremlin idea and all that. There's no problem with that. But it is only when uh, one idea of India dominates and practices academic apartheid. That is what has happened in the last so many years. And uh, when that dominant idea is no more dominant, it accuses the others of being intolerant. So, you see, there has to be a certain amount of balance. You cannot, you cannot practice academic apartheid for decades, not allow a certain amount, certain conception of India to come up, and then we, it tries to break the ceiling, you accuse it of being etc, uh, etc. Et you see, it's very interesting, I was reading, because uh, this is the centenary year of Deendal Upadhyay, and uh, had Mr. Modi not been in power, probably we wouldn't have even heard of Deendal Upadhyay as of this year. Uh, he says something very interesting in conclusion of his integral humanism. He says that we have taken due note of our ancient culture, but we are not archaeologists. 
we do not want to be the repositories of a museum but we want to understand this ancient culture and try and contextualize it in the present context and whatever is regressive in that culture whatever doesn't live up to the you know the the flow of time we need to examine and reject and accept uh, what is uh, and remain open to newer ideas so i think you know again this academic apartheid has made a very selective reading of these thinkers and that is the point i made when i said that we should have more centers like that for example there should be centers where you study the history of the communist party in india ems ems is immense contribution in creating this movement there should be centers where you study dindayal upadhyay where you study dr shama prashad mukherjee there has to be a balance in this approach i was i just uh, when rajiv was pointing out as a new parliamentarian when i went uh, orientation programs were there so in that orientation program when senior parliamentarians were taking taking classes why he was you were pointing out the necessity of history i felt for the last two years that the voice of dissent has been curtailed every moment so in that class i for the first time learned that a young man the sino indian border conflict rajiv will call it sino indian war i will call it sino indian border conflict in when in 62 that sino indian border conflict was going on a young parliamentarian he went to nehru he asked him that the parliament needs to be called pandit nehru said that now the war is going on how can i call the parliament the young man told him that lok sabha is not a continuous body rajya sabha is a continuous body you convene that house to pandit nehru when that war was going on or the conflict was going on the rajya sabha was convened for a very short period very short period and in that house that young man he just criticized nehru like anything he basically attacked nehru the communists also they were not there they were mostly Uh, inside jail but that young man he criticized nehru pandit nehru knew that this young man will criticize him he will criticize him vehemently that young man was atal bihari bajpay but nehru called the parliament that's the right you provide right for dissent that's why nehru remains different from others it's i want to uh, can i make the conversation where ne- nehru actually sort of predicted that this man may one day be yes. the prime minister of india can i can i just Uh, if i don't mention this uh, it will be very interesting for our discussion here in his uh, universe higher education uh, university report 1948 dr radhakrishnan makes a very interesting point and uh, that is uh, he talks about the danger of teacher politician and he says that we were told that in several cases teacher politicians have succeeded better in their career than teachers who have devoted themselves to teaching and scholarship the success of teacher politicians who manipulate elections and get for themselves and their friends influential and lucrative positions in their own our sister universities is largely responsible for the deterioration of the morals of teachers and of the academic standards of the universities those were innocent times anirban now they construct universities those were very innocent times i just want to co- close this session by saying that there is a responsibility that government has there is a larger responsibility that society has on knowing what is india and what is bharat you can have picnics housey contests tv serials everything all those people who say that not enough of bharat is known should also be holding to task or holding to accountability all the channels entertainment channels which don't come up and show this thing and final word i want to say is that there are many ideas of india we need to know all the indias that are need to be known you can only interrogate history you cannot prosecute history thank you thank you so much gentlemen let's give them another big round of applause I have learned one more thing here because Mr. Banerjee is here. I didn't know the difference between conflict and war. Because he says it was a conflict. I didn't know in conflict you exchange fire, border guns. Border conflict. Border, border conflict was happening through exchange of fire. 
because I thought conflict was a conflict of ideas, not on weapons. But he has defined conflict as also a conflict of ideas. <laughs> that is a master's interpretation anyway. I was very, very good. It was a very good discussion. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. We present a small memento from our side.